Definitely. Okay. All right, guys. So take two. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about the power outage. We're back. Uh, so I'll start from the top. All right. So we're here with Dan Blakely. He's the author of the Twenty Year War. Uh, it's a phot photography book that profiles combat veterans from the global war on terror. Uh, Dan also served in uh, Second Ranger Battalion, uh, six deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, we're stoked to he have you here in studio. Technical issues aside, yeah. Um, so like, as far as your origin story, let's just jump right back, back through it real quick. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'm sorry to make you repeat yourself. No, no, all good. It's, this stuff happens all the time. So, uh, for people who aren't in the area too, to know, it's probably the storms, that are, storms yeah, yeah. that are coming through New York. But, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, my, my, I grew up as a military brat. So my dad was in the air force for 21 years. Um, and, uh, traveled all over you know lived in all, all types of different places i was born in texas lived in uh traveled abroad a few times so iceland japan um lived in northern california and nebraska uh, and it was in nebraska when my dad got out of the air force awesome. retired after 21 years um which a lot of people would be like oh nebraska but it was actually a great place to grow up because um, i love ice hockey and there was actually a really good uh, ice hockey program there um but it was really interesting up until uh, we left Nebraska and then moved to Yucca Valley, California, which anybody who's a Marine knows about 29 Palms, and it's just a desert town, and it's kind of the crappy. Stumps. Yeah, 29 Stumps. It's a, it's kind of a crappy place to grow up. Uh, you can get in a, into a lot of trouble as a kid out there very <laughs> easily, um, and we certainly did. And uh, so ended up back in Yucca Valley, and uh, that's where my grandparents live, so that's why we ended up there. Um and uh, the high school I was going to was just a really shitty school at the time. Uh, supposedly it's gotten better, but um, just really bad things, like a lot of drugs, uh, alcohol. Uh, there was, like, STDs and stuff all throughout the school. Um, and, the you know, the entire staff, like teachers all the way through up to the administration, they just didn't care, honestly. They didn't care about the kids enough. Um, so people were just doing whatever they wanted. And... That's not the structure, you know, I grew up in. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was a pretty good kid in school up until going there. And uh, I started slipping quite a bit. And I was like, all right, I got I to gotta change something. I, I, I can't keep going to school here. Um, so I, had, I didn't tell my parents. My parents knew that I didn't want to join the military. But I ended up uh, going ahead and going to the recruiter's office, which was right down the road from the school, actually. Um, and uh, they had all the recruiters all right next to each other their doors were right next to each other so you could literally just you know pick which one do you want to go to marines air force army navy uh and i knew i did not want to go to the air force because that's what my dad did um i didn't want to be a marine because i'd end up probably right back where i'm trying to leave from and so i didn't want to be back in 29 palms uh and then i i didn't want to be on a ship i didn't like just being on a boat for extended periods of time I still, to this day, don't even want to go on a cruise. Like, I just, it, I don't know why, but it, it's just not attractive to me. So, so I was like, okay, I'm going to join the Army. Um, so I was 17 at the time, and I finally told my parents after I talked to the recruiter, uh, hey, is there something I can do to, you know, get in the military and out of here as quick as possible? And I, I found a, uh, a program I could go to at night college, basically, to take uh, high school level classes and graduate as quick as I could. And uh, so that's that's what I wanted to do. Told my parents, you know, presented them with this idea. Um, and my dad was pretty supportive of it. Uh, my mom was obviously very reluctant because this was end of 2005. So height really of both the wars and right. mostly Iraq, but also still Afghanistan was going on at the same time. So uh, and I think there was a surge right around that period of time as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my mom's like, fine, you can you can go, you can join the army, but don't do anything that's going to put you directly in combat. So I said, okay, I won't. Went back to the recruiter. I said, my mom doesn't want me to go to combat. What can I do? But I want to do something exciting because I don't want to just like do a desk job or something. Uh, and he was like, well, you could be a parachute rigger because at least you'll be able to jump out of airplanes, but chances are you will, won't end up in direct combat. So I was like, great. Uh, got my parents to sign off the paperwork to say, okay, you can join at 17. Um, 
and then I remember the day that I went to actually enlist and like sign my final enlistment paperwork. I sent it across the table from this major and uh, he was like, I don't know what to tell you, son, but this, th that job that you initially signed up for parachute rigger is no longer available. And I said, okay, well, uh, I'll do the other airborne job. And he was like, airborne ranger. I was like, yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself into other than, you know, the stuff that I've seen in the movies. So, you know, I've seen Black Hawk Down and Saving Private Ryan and stuff. So like I knew that. Uh, and then one of my childhood best friends, who's also the photographer for the book, uh, he lived a few houses down from my grandparents. So every time I visited them every summer, we hung out. And then when we moved there, we hung out all the time. He was very much a, a war junkie. Like he was all about, you know, every he knew everything about the military, at least as much as he could know without, you know, being old enough to serve yet. And uh, so I learned everything from him and then those two movies. And uh, and I, I think it's a, a combination of I'm, I'm, I'm too naive and also just uh, I refuse to quit on anything. So I was just like, okay, well, I sign up for it. I'm going through. And uh, so I, I joined in summer 2006, went through everything, you know, basic training, uh, airborne school, RIP, the Ranger Indoctrination Program at the time. It's not RASP. Um, and ended up uh, assigned to Second Ranger Battalion in December of 2006. And I think um, this is where we got cut off. Yeah. And you were about <laughs> to tell us uh, what the best battalion is and why <laughs> it is Second Battalion. So you want to know a funny story about this? Uh, there's there's uh, people put it in text all the time, right? The the two carrots or the two brackets, or whatever, and then a two between it, right? Like the diamond from yeah, the World diamond. War II era World War II. Yeah. So only first and fifth had the diamond, and uh, so what I always say, which is funny, is one is less than two, <laughs> and two is greater than three. Does that make sense? <laughs> exactly. There's so that's why second. It's too much arithmetic <laughs> for me to handle on one podcast. <laughs> That's why uh, Second Ranger Battalion is the best. Um, so right. I didn't make it up. They they determined it's it. Exactly. It's mathematics. Exactly. Mathematics. So you can't argue with science. <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be because you guys all have like platoon names, like the Mad Slashers and yep. all this crazy shit. Yeah, I was in. Uh, it's funny when I ended up there. So I was in in Three Charlie. Um, they didn't really have a name. They had a mascot, and they were trying to figure out like, okay, what's the origins? And it was it was a pirate, and they were like, well, what like what a pirate? What do you call pirates? And uh, you guys so, are not banks. <laughs> yeah, we're all about the booty. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we uh, uh, so we were scallywags. The scallywags. Uh, scallywags. Yeah. And um, but uh, yeah, so I ended up at, at Second Ranger Battalion. It was uh, a a great time, and I, I lied to my mom for a long time <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, as you can imagine, she she knew that I ended up signing a contract to go to Ranger Regiment, but I just lied to her the entire time, and I just told her like. Don't worry, I'm in a safe place, which in, in some regards it is true because Second Ranger Battalion, all the Ranger Battalions, uh, any, anything in special operations for the most part, uh, you have some of the best gear, you have the best trained people, you have the best assets, you have the best intel for the most part across the board. So you do get a lot more support mm -hmm. than, say, like a conventional unit. Right. Um, so I wasn't fully lying to her, but I just didn't tell her about like all of the operations her I had been lies. on and stuff like yeah. that. Some omissions. Yeah. yeah. A few redactions from, yeah. uh, from, from, uh, from reality. But so what was that like for you being, um, a young ranger showing up in 2006, 2000, 2006 was when I was assigned, I like showed up at the door cause you had to go through like the, the transfer process or whatever. So I showed up at the door like. January third, two thousand seven. Okay, yeah. and so you know you're you're walking into an organization that has already been at war mm -hmm. for quite a while and, and pretty successful at it. I mean, there were a lot of lessons learned and whatnot. Yeah, but um, the Rangers were they were laying some hate at the time. Yeah, they were, and uh, so our our platoon uh, specifically two three Charlie. Um, they just I showed up. And then I was on rear D, so they were deployed at the time when I showed up. They got back, I think, seven days after I was assigned. So, of course, you know, they're coming back, and I know nothing. And I see these, like, uh, just, just, you could see just 
war uh, torn people, you know what I mean, coming back from uh, heavy deployment because it was a Ramadi deployment, uh, which if anybody knows Ramadi at that time, it was uh, it was a lot of uh, firefights and things like that. So it was a, it was a heavy deployment. Um, and so I come back from that and I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll, you tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. Obviously I was a private too. So you're, you're going to get scuffed up and do all the things that you normally happen to you as a private, especially going into a, a range battalion. And, uh, but I started hearing the stories as well of, of everything that the guys had gone through because, uh, three Charlie was part of the recovery for operation red wings as well. Um, and so it was, it was crazy to hear some of the stuff that they had gone through. I think it was two deployments prior at that point, two or three deployments prior. Um, and I, again, I knew nothing except for what was in the movie. So it was a quick education of, uh, everything that had happened, you know, in Afghanistan and what's going on in Iraq and things like that. And I'm still trying to learn my job. So, um, Ranger Regiment's crazy because you're, you're drinking from the fire hose from day one. And it never stops until you leave because as a private, you're getting all this information. You're learning all your skill level zero, skill level one type stuff. You're getting some advanced training now. You're expected to go from somebody coming basically out of, out of basic training. Yes, you get some more advanced training and, and rip, but you still don't know enough to really apply anything you've learned. And you're expected to be, you know, an operator basically by the next deployment you're expected to be a part of the team that can uh make sure that you know you're clearing rooms you're supporting your buddies you're uh supporting breaches you're uh having to do first aid if you have to like because we're trained on all of it so um it's it's a very intense environment to to grow up in but it was the best environment to grow up in as well i think and what was the timeline for your next deployment so I got there in January. My first deployment was June 2006. So I enlisted, no, 2007. I enlisted June 2006. I deployed June 2007. So I was 18 for like f five or six months when mm -hmm. I deployed. <laughs> so I was young. So where was that first deployment to? Uh, my first deployment was to Missoula. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first two deployments were there. And uh, it was, I can't remember the name of, of what they were calling this, but it was a, a certain operation that um, they were basically cracking down on everything. So uh, we had crazy high op tempo. Our deployments are usually 90 to 110 days long. And in those first two deployments of 180 to 200 days, we did well over 300 missions. Mm -hmm. So like some days, depending if the weather's fine, you could go out two, three, four times in a day, which is like when I talked to conventional units and other people who like did the typical type of room clearing operation stabilization after you, you know, go through and clear like a, a block or something like that. They're usually there for at least a day, you know, before they actually leave, we would get a target be out within 30 minutes out of the gate. So you're, you're getting a, a call. that's like, Hey, it's time to go throw it on your kit as fast as you can. And you're out the gate. So in 30 minutes. time sensitive targets. Exactly. Yeah. All of them were, were yeah. TSTs and, uh, and so we were, we were out and this is where I knew that I was in the right place because again, I, I just, the way I, I work still too, is like, I, I want to be the best of the best at whatever I'm doing mm -hmm. as much as I can be. And, uh, as soon as I saw us go through and clear entire houses in literally less than 30 to 60 seconds, you know, multi-level buildings, I was like, yeah, I'm in the right place. And were you guys still uh, using the strikers for most of these missions? Yep. Yeah. So we were in strikers all three of my deployments to uh, to Iraq. So the uh, just to like expand a little bit on what you guys were doing. I mean, the idea was that you're like trying to get ahead of the insurgency by the it, not always the quality, but with the quantity of the amount of operations that you're doing. Yep. Um, and I don't know if you want to comment on the efficacy of that or not, but um, so a very intense deployment though. I mean, every, every day, every night, multiple times a night. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, um, and, and people who's not in the know may think like, oh, you're going out that many times you're in a firefight every time. That's not true. Like we, the, the amount of times, like we were all about, um, you know, speed and surprise, especially to the enemy as quick as we could. So violence of action, you know, you get to the target, you, you 
place a charge, you bang in there, you clear the rooms as fast as you can. Oftentimes, they just, whoever we're going after, even if it was somebody who uh, was, in fact, a bad guy who had guns and S vests or whatever waiting for us, they didn't have enough time to get it. Right. Um, and so, you know, probably about a quarter of them, we were getting into small ticks and, and firefights. Um, uh, really, IEDs and at that time was like the biggest thing for us is, is uh, in booby-trapped houses. Not as bad, but um, they definitely happened every, every now and then. But uh, IEDs just on all the roadways. That's when like the, um, uh, what were they called? The uh, EFPs. EFPs. Yeah, EFPs. EFPs were taken off. And man, the number of times. So when we went, we were driving basically as fast as a striker would drive, which is, I think the top speed was like 75 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. So we were just gunning it, literally pedal to the metal as fast as we could get there because those timing devices or even the triggers aren't fast enough, like they're old shitty wire, right? So as soon as you go over a pressure plate or something like that, it, there is a few milliseconds where it's going to take a second for it to actually detonate and go off. So I know I like we survived all the IEDs that we did because we were driving fast enough. Mm -hmm. Like the number of times we had gas tanks or like our rear tires blown off or something like that was wild. So it, it would go off in the gap between the vehicles or just catch the tail end of yeah. you as you were yep. heading through there. And it has, what, eight wheels? So if you lose one... Yep, you, you can drive on up, or as, as little as four, I think. So you can have four flats and you're fine. Now, uh, the EFPs, um, I mean, can you tell us about those and why they were a game changer when it came to... Yeah, IEDs. so um, similar to an RPG um, is you have a shape charge on the back end of an RPG. And uh, so it's a conical shape and there's an explosive in there on the back end of it. And then you have some sort of metal on the front end. And so when the explosive goes off, basically it, it pushes and inverts uh, the metal that's, that's on the other side of the cone. And it basically turns it into a insanely fast ball of whatever steel or metal they're using and it can penetrate just about anything um so they figured out you know the insurgents found out pretty quickly that these efps can penetrate the armor of our vehicles and so they would set them up most of the time they would set them up at um basically at you know a couple feet off the ground four four or five feet off the ground uh because that they knew that's basically where the engines were or the drivers were or the crew on the inside were so they weren't going for tires they were going for kill shots um and we had one time where we did hit an efp and it tore through our striker and missed everybody holy oh. shit and by absolute complete like grace of whoever above and uh like the fact that nobody got injured at all literally you could see the hole through the striker and like it passed, went like, in right between past. two guys yeah like, oh my God. we had another time too that it was a ground based one IED that blew right in between. Uh, in a striker, you have a, a gunner that's sitting like tight, like this, basically. And then you have a TC that's just right to the left of them, standing out of the hatch, basically telling the driver where to go and everything, navigating or, or just calling out anything to the gunner. And uh, we had one go off and go right in between, uh, right between <laughs> oh the gunner God. and the, the TC. And again, nobody hurt in a sense of like no shrapnel things like that right every time one of those went off though we got over pressure you're still getting the yeah. over pressure getting, inside this can basically yeah. you're getting your bell rung yeah and we uh we learned really early when all these ieds and stuff are happening is like you have to keep the hatches open even if you're you don't have people out of them you had to have them propped open because the, hatches yeah, and everything. yeah because the uh the over pressure was so intense that like it would r ring your bell and like you would get some uh you know, some, some overpressure sickness and stuff like that from being inside of it. Yeah. So your mission ineffective, basically, if, yeah. you, if we didn't do that. Were, were there any, like, particular operations during this time frame that, like, really stand out in your mind? Yeah, my very first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy because uh, rangers are interesting because um, you see special operations just in general across the board and you see like these big burly guys like that's the normal thing you know you see when you see imagery of like special operations but uh really in the ranger regiment yeah there are the big guys but there's a lot of little guys like a ton and that's because we we move fast like mm -hmm. we run we're sprinting we're going from place to place and i was one of the little guys on my team and uh uh the very first house we go to hit um, I remember we couldn't get ladders up for some reason and the, the retaining wall, uh, the main wall that surrounded the compound 
uh, had like broken glass and stuff because they that's what they would do to prevent people from going into their compound and stealing stuff and stuff like that. So they would put like broken glass shards on the top. Um, so we had like these rugs that we would carry with us and throw over. And I was the little guy, so uh, they could easily just basically throw me over, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then basically get in the courtyard, pull security, and wait for everybody else to come over. But uh, I used to tell people this all the time, and I, it's still true. Like. Rangers in that time were ninjas with nods. Like, we were just quiet and super effective of what we had to do. So, yeah, I say I was thrown over, but I was going over slow. Like, I, I got over very methodically and everything. And uh, I got over the wall, and I'm hiding in the shadows. And this lady comes out, and they have a light on outside, but I'm literally in the shadows of the courtyard. And she, she dusts off her rug, like, right in front of me. And I'm like, how the fuck does she not see me? Like, how is she not seeing me right now? And I was terrified because I was the only guy in at that point. And then finally she goes back inside because they stopped coming over too. Or they just stopped. They weren't going to come over because I was the only one. And they would have saw, she would have saw everybody. So uh, once she goes back inside, then everybody else hops over. Uh, and then we just rush straight in to clear the building. And uh, so that was the first building we went to. And that was the first time I got to experience, like, what it was like to actually clear a building. And again, we did it in... I don't know, 30 to 60 seconds. And this was a three story building. And I was just like, this is incredible that we can do this. Like, I can't, I can't believe that this is how we do things. We had a follow on target the very same night. And that time they knew we figured they knew they'd heard somebody probably would have called or mm -hmm. anything like that. Like mm -hmm. they would have just known that we were there. So our other way of clearing buildings at the time was just to go explosive, to go uh, kinetic. Um, so we get to the building stack up on the gate, place a gate charge, blow it, go in, blow the first door to get in because it was locked. Um, by that point, they know for sure that we're there. Like you can't go from blowing a gate, blowing a door within 30 seconds. You know what I mean? It takes a little bit of time. So we go in and clear the very first room we go into. Uh, there's an insurgent in there and my squad leader and team leader are in front of me and they go in and uh, basically between the three of us, we stitch this guy up. Uh, and that's my very first mission, like to go from never doing anything <laughs> right. to going into this like ninja mode of jumping this wall and clearing this house to then my very first mission. I'm like, I don't know if I'm the one that had the kill shot or somebody else did. It doesn't matter. But the fact that, you know, I fired my weapon on my very, very first mission. So it was, uh, it was intense. Yeah. When you, uh, when you, I mean, when you get back to base then and everybody goes to play Halo or whatever they do, yeah, uh, <laughs> Call of Duty <laughs> Halo, um, like, what are you, a young, freshly minted 18 year old ranger, thinking about your first combat operation? Uh, I can't pinpoint where this comes from, but I like even. A few years ago, several years ago, I got a, uh, I hit a deer on the side of the road. My wife was with me. She freaked out. She's going crazy. Like, I look at my heart rate. It's like normal. <laughs> and I don't know what, where that comes from, but, like, I was excited about the whole event, but I wasn't, like, I don't know, taken by it. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Right. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't freaked out by it. I wasn't nervous or anxious or anything i was just like that was awesome mm -hmm. you know what i mean and and then from there it was just like okay what else do i need to learn mm -hmm. and what else do i need to do to like be the breacher because now i want to blow stuff up i saw that happen it's like right. i want to do that right um so then it was just from that point it's like i just want to take in all the information that i can and learn as, as much as i can and get good at this job yeah and so what was the rest of that deployment like for you intense but so again we're all young you know 18 to you know squad leaders even are 23 24 25 years old so we're still yeah. young you know between our 20s to late teens and so we had plenty of of times where it's like we're just having fun too you know what i mean like uh again ranger regiment's one of the best places to grow up because you get to have these experiences of these like uh incredible mission sets but at the same time you get all the support and perks like that so you know, we were living in these, uh, these nice uh, chews, uh, you know, whatever they called them, uh, something, housing units. Compartmentalized housing units. Yeah, compartmentalized yeah. housing units. And uh, 
we had everything we needed, you know, nice beds. We had TVs. We had Guitar Hero and Call of Duty and whatever <laughs> yeah. we wanted to play. And so it was uh, it was very easy. You know, we had gym, a gym right there. So it was like, you know, you're either you're either preparing and training for the next mission. You're uh, working out or you're eating, playing video games or just hanging out, you know. And uh, and that's that's basically how every deployment was. It's like prepare for the mission. Make sure everything's good to go. Get in the training when you can. Definitely hit the gym every day. And then during the downtime, it was like movies, video games, like whatever you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. We uh, need to say hey to our sponsors for tonight. Um, so the first one, um, the Light Sleeper. Yeah, awesome uh, product. Made by a friend of the show. Uh, I took it on vacation late, uh, just recently. And this thing is a whoopee. It's a chill liner. But what they did is uh, actually sew it up. So there's a pouch in there that you can put your sleeping pad in. And then there's another pouch that you can put an inflatable pillow in. And it all stuffs into a little stuff sack. And you can take it with you. Uh, it's one of the best products out there. I can't believe somebody didn't invent this thing before. Um Every guy who served in the military knows that the Wooby is basically the best invention to ever come around. DARPA has yet to surpass it, even though they're trying <laughs> uh, at the taxpayer's expense. But the Cho liner is still the best thing going. And the light sleeper is basically just an upgrade on, on that you know issued piece of gear. Um, and if you guys want to get 10% off, you can use a link down in the description. You'll get 10% off your order if you go there and use it right now. It's an affordable product. It's great for camping, hiking. Yeah, uh, we, we had one, but Jack took it on his trip and has since not. I, I bogarted it. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, still sleeps in it now. So go check it out. It is uh, thelightsleeper.com. And if you use the link in the description, you'll get 10% off your order. That's L I T E, thelightsleeper.com. Um, and our second sponsor for tonight is our friend uh, Toby uh, Harnden over at the AARP Veteran Report. Um, it's a free, twice free, I'm going to say that again, free, twice monthly email newsletter that salutes military service and provides a mixture of inspirational human stories and practical information for vets. You can subscribe to the AARP Veteran Report by going to aarp.org, even if you're not an AARP, which, I mean, some of us should be, some of us are, aarp.org slash vet report. Um, it's free. The newsletter gets in your e email box the second and fourth Thursday of each month. They don't spam you. They don't send you anything else. They send you the newsletter. Um, they've got, you know, great articles. They said Toby works on it, who's been on the show a couple times, Justin Sapp. Uh, as uh, written for them, um, they you know it, it's a great it's a great way to keep up with the vet community. They have there are a couple of regular features that are cool. My hero, my hero about a veteran someone really admires, and then then and now a cool story about veterans back in the day and what they're doing now, which is also a bit like your book, yeah. Which is the GWAT right GWAT veterans, but what they're doing with their lives now and and everything else like that. Um, but anyway, it's free. You won't get spammed. Check it out. AARP.org slash vet report. Um, it's free. You should do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. And please subscribe to our Patreon. If you guys want to support the channel, the link's down in the description. Like, share, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe your dog if he isn't subscribed yet. Come on, guys. What? <laughs> yeah. All right. Back to the star of the show. So, Dan, so uh, are there any other, like, really notable events on that first deployment that you can recall, other than it just being a green world? <laughs> uh, no, it was, uh, it, it was just very interesting, kind of going back to what you were initially saying. It's like the way that we, we targeted individuals was very unique. It, it, it hadn't happened really much elsewhere throughout the war. Um, I think they probably figured out, like, the TTPs and stuff were – Probably not uh, satisfying to the local populace, <laughs> um, but it was uh, it, it was very intense, and um, I learned so much from those first two deployments that really set me up for you know the rain the remainder of my deployments, uh, and it was uh, you know it was the most impactful on my life really from that point forward. Yeah, 
And then the second deployment was right back to the same place, back to yep. Missoula. Yeah, it was just doing the same thing all over again. <laughs> and you got Groundhog Day. Well, I mean, were there any of these operations where things kind of went sideways that, you know, where you're like, fuck, man? Uh, yeah, I mean, the ones where, well, there were plenty of times where, like, a, a vehicle would get blown up, disabled, and then that just obviously kinks the mission like right there now we got to focus on getting the vehicle rehabilita rehabilitated making sure everybody's safe and secure get get back uh to base but you know I, I would say a lot of times we just got lucky like honest honest to god like the number of times we got lucky where we were in, in significant ticks firefights like uh s vests and ieds and stuff like that that just we got lucky i i have no other way to describe what happened but um you know we had the right people in the right place at the right time um, who were ready to pull the trigger when it was time. And uh, luckily, those first two deployments, I don't think we had really any uh, casualties. Like, we, we got super fortunate. I mean, what were some of those events like? I mean, was it just the case that, like, you yanked them out of bed before they were able to reach for their weapon? Or Yeah, um, that's exactly it. Like, uh, again, we're, we were super efficient. Um, uh, it wasn't me, but it was another squad. Um, and... Uh, they were going to clear a room and uh, one of the guys, and this actually came out in a book, I can't remember the name of the book, but uh, um, one of the guys, the main, uh, he was an HVT, so that he was actually, a, I think he was a tier two guy technically, but he was still an HVT for the area. Um, he had an S vest and we woke him up from clearing the house. He was on the second level, uh, team gets up there, you know, comes in the room and the guy has the S vest in his hand, is about to pull it and they stitch him up. And then he drops it, obviously, because he, he dies right there. And his wife goes for the vest. Oh, man. And, uh, yeah. And they're yelling at her, like, don't fucking do it. Don't fucking do it. And she, no kidding, did. Rolled out of the bed over him, grabbed the vest, like, was starting to turn up to, like, do it. And then they had to stitch her up, too. Yeah. So, uh most of you probably got it and know it, but an S vest is a suicide vest, which is like one of your worst nightmares yeah. uh, when dealing with, uh, especially rooms there, because uh, you know you think about like American rooms, you know, um, a bedroom. Well, depending on where you live, maybe not here in New York, but uh, bedrooms in a lot of like the Midwest or elsewhere in the country, like they're pretty big. Yeah, but no, this is like New York's like Afghanistan, exactly. Right? In, yeah. in Iraq, yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. the bedrooms yeah. are a lot smaller. In so Iraq, like, yeah. Where, where you're coming in, and when I say, like, she was right there and rolling over to get the vest, like, she's from me to you, you know, yeah. away doing this. And, and so to, like, if that thing went off, you yeah. know, it would have been, at a minimum, a severe casualty, if not, you know, fatal. Yeah. Um, so it's it's no joke. So your, your, both your first two trips were to, were to Iraq, and then let me ask you real quick. So you're, you know, you show up. You're a young private. They're coming off of the deployment when, you know, when you first show up to Ranger Battalion. Now you're the guy coming back in between your, your yeah. two deployments. Um, what was that like for you? And, uh, and obviously, as a younger guy, you have to take responsibility a lot of times for the, new, the newbies, yep. for the nugs. Uh, what's that like for you? Uh, it was very interesting because uh, between deployments, this is another thing that especially people who don't know about the Ranger Regiment is like you go through RIP or RASP now, um, you know, you get, you get your, your scroll. So you get, uh, you know, your tambourine now and uh, you get your Ranger scroll. But as somebody growing up in Ranger Regiment, you're still always expected to go to Ranger school. So uh, I got back from my first deployment. I think I did a few like local trainings, but then I went to Ranger school. And immediately following ranger school, I end up back in Missoula. So it was like a quick boom, boom, boom. Uh, and when you come back, you know, you're a tab spec four. So you have a ranger tab and you're a E4 specialist. You matter. Yeah, yeah. a little bit more. You yeah. think you matter. Yeah, yeah really, right, right. You're part of the E4 mafia still. Right. And like, uh, yeah, you're trying to get away. You're, it's called a, a sham shield. And uh, you still try and figure out how you don't have to do the things that you had to do when you were a private now. And you're just trying to figure <laughs> out your, your way in the world because you're not... You're not a team leader. Um, you're kind of like in this in-between place where, yes, the team leaders now and squad leaders are trying to put a little bit more responsibility on you to, to teach the young privates who are coming in and coming up. Um, so there was that leadership component, you know, that, that is now placed on, on me. 
uh, anybody who's you know coming in uh, at that point and uh and so yeah it was interesting to to go through that process and and basically tell the guys like hey we're about to do exactly what we did last summer um let me tell you all the things that went right went wrong you know do a do a debrief and like tell them this is how we should operate and uh the surprising thing is we didn't change a whole lot like our surprisingly you know a year you would think the enemy would change a little bit ttps should shift a little bit Um, but for the most part we did a lot of the same stuff Um, they were getting a little bit smarter and they were uh, starting to to basically rig up houses so you know Mm. putting ieds in in houses and stuff like that Um, and so if we knew we were going after like an ied or sfs manufacturer we we might do a call out Mm -hmm. um, which is where basically you're just telling people to get out of the building Otherwise, if we come in after you, you're probably going to get killed. Um, and so we uh, we would do that every once in a while. But again, it was only if we knew they were an IED manufacturer or an SFS manufacturer. Um, but yeah, just just teaching you know people how to do their job. And really, in Rage Regiment, it's more about like how do I teach you enough and well enough that I know if we get in a tick or a firefight or whatever or I get injured, you know what to do so that you can cover for me. And, uh, that's, that's really what you're trying to do as quick as possible. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, again, Ranger Regiment is such an interesting place to grow up because of the high op tempo, the quick cycles that you go through of, uh, training, deploying, training, deploying, training, deploying, especially at that time. Cause you were doing six to nine months training cycles and then you were doing three to six month deployments and you're just doing that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So you ne- never had any downtime. Yeah. And so then deployment three is your first time to, was that back to Iraq or over to Afghanistan? It was uh, Baghdad. Baghdad, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. Third deployment was to Baghdad, which at that point now was very different. Um, my second deployment was uh, a joint task force. Um, so my first deployment was not a joint task force at all. My second deployment was a joint task force with a, a special mission unit. Um, and then my uh, third deployment was actually with, uh, uh, with one of the SEAL teams. I think it was Team 10. Um, And so that was interesting because you you learn a lot of TTPs of how they do things too. And uh, again, still relatively young. I think I was a corporal at that time. Uh, I think I was a corporal promotable. So I was about to become an E5. Um, And uh, you're just, you're, you know, you're picking their brain. You're trying to figure out exactly what they do. At this time, I was actually part of a weapon squad too. So um, Mm -hmm. I was actually in charge of the trucks. Uh, I was in charge of building the routes and doing everything like that. Um, cause some, again, something people may not know is like for our unit, uh, we're in charge of driving our own guys. Like it's all our Rangers. Rangers are in charge of hauling Rangers around unless you're flying, then it's one sixtieth. Um, so I did that for anything that was a mounted, um, mission. And then anything that we did fly out, then obviously I was, a, I think I was a, what is it? 48, yeah, 48 gunner, which was, a basically a shortened down version of a 240 Bravo. Um, but that was, uh, it was very different. It was a lot of fun, actually. Um, I messed with uh, the team guys so much. <laughs> they gave rightly me, so. Yeah, rightly so. They gave me a nickname. They had it coming. <laughs> they gave me a nickname. Uh, they called me Sergeant Fathom. So yeah, I did become an E5 while I was there, and they called me Sergeant Fathom, which anybody who's in the Navy, a fathom is a distance in the ocean. So it's like, uh, you know, people say something's unfathomable, right? It's like, because it's so far, like you just can't imagine how to get there. Um, so they called me Sergeant Fathom because I would just do things to them all the time that they just wasn't imaginable. Like I would, I would fuck with them so bad. Like one, uh, one night we got stuck and it was because uh, we drove out and then there was uh, winds that were coming through a storm or whatever. So it blew a bunch of dust up. And uh, they were like, oh, how are we going to, like, what are we going to do? How do we get back on mission and stuff like that? And I had uh, comms to the jock at the time. Uh, and only, like, senior level guys would also have comms to the jock. Otherwise, like, the normal team guys, they don't know really what's going on. And so one of them, like, poked me and was like, what's going on? I, like, call across to all the trucks. I was like, oh, yeah, we're just waiting for the jock to turn the dust fans on to clear everything out. And they bought it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They are like, we have... <laughs> We have dust fans to clear this out. I was like, "Oh yeah, we got dust fans like all over Baghdad. They just turn them on and it'll clear it all out. We're just waiting for them to kick in." <laughs> so, were 
you and the seals doing uh, joint operations, or were you like swapping targets? Like, yeah. So we would both. It depends. Um, usually we would swap. So like they would they would be security for one, then we would have an assault force, mm -hmm. and then they would be an assault force for one. We would be security. That's pretty cool. So I mean, how did how did it work out? Yeah, and how do you, you taught them what security was? <laughs> They do security very different. Um, uh, no, just it, kidding. We love seals. <laughs> no, it was honestly, uh, it was a good relationship. Honestly, we, I, I know a lot of other people like have had bad relationships, have had like you know talk shit and like have horrible experiences with some of the team guys, but we, we for the most part didn't. We had a very cordial, very, uh, um, very um, bonded team. You know, That's cool. like yeah, like. Uh, you know, they had all the cool guns and stuff like that, for instance, right? They brought all their kit with them. And uh, we only, you know, had what we were issued, which is, you know, M4s, uh, you know, uh, M9 pistols. Like, yeah, we had the Mark 46 and the Mark 48s and stuff like that, which are kind of cool. They're different. And our M4s also were different than your standard M4. But, you know, they've got everything, uh, you know, uh, any, anything you could take off off the shelf, like they brought it with them, and then uh, whenever they went to the range, they were just like, if we wanted to go, we'd go and shoot with them too from time to time. So um, it was fun. It was a good deployment. I mean, what what was it like? I mean, just to like drill down into it a little bit more. Like again, not to talk. Jack's shit. looking for dirt. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm really not. I, I am looking for like, dirt. like, like sort of like the the difference between the two units that you had mentioned and like how you guys were different but also the same and like ended up working together and it sounds like a, a good relationship yeah um honestly i think it was so good because the leadership that we had on both sides wanted to share knowledge mm -hmm. they wanted to learn from each other so like we even had our op tempo was not as high as Mizzou, so another you know 110 day deployment roughly we we maybe only did 40 50 missions that time mm -hmm. whereas again my previous two deployments were over 120 150. Yeah, yeah exactly for a 110 <laughs> day deployment so it was very different we had a lot more downtime uh to be able to go over things and like they wanted to learn from us too because they're they don't use strikers so it was like okay training them on all everything strikers you know like how to drive them how to shoot the uh, the guns um you know how to dismount even like like teaching them everything uh and then same for for them teaching us like they have different ttps they have different lingo and like learning their lingo for instance they don't say you know moving to second floor third floor it's first deck second deck third deck you know every, what I mean? every machine gun is the 60 yeah like <laughs> like stuff like that that they just we had to learn how to talk to each other um so it was it was interesting and then also we shared assets for everything so um like we had, uh, uh, for instance, like our, our EOD guy, yeah, our EOD guy was a team guy, um, but then we had a dog who there, sh which was a ranger, but they shared. So like we were sharing, um, you know, attachments as well. So it was a uh, it was a good joint task force. That's cool. Yeah. And so did you think after this deployment, like I want to go be a swimmer? No, not at all. <laughs> I was like, I'm still glad with where I'm at. Uh, you know, I will say the only thing that made me like slightly second guess a little bit was like, okay, these guys are getting a little bit cooler equipment than we are. It was like, all right, when are we going to get that? You know, it was that, that sort of mentality. It's like we knew they had a lot more kit to choose from. Ours was very issued. Right, like, right. If you're a rifleman, this is what you get. If you're a saw gunner, this is what you get. If you're a machine gunner, this is what you get. If you're a team leader, this is what you get. You know, I mean, it was very regimented, uh, which is why we were also very effective of what we did. Like point point raids, like uh, being the most elite infantry unit in the U.S. military is is very true because we were very pinholed. You know, we were like, we're going to be the best of the best that we can be of being an advanced infantry unit. That's what we're going to focus on. Whereas SEAL teams, you know, they're focused all across the board. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, they're doing host hostage rescue training. They're doing... Uh, Shipboard stuff. Exactly. Yeah. They're doing... DT uh, missions. Exactly. All that. So they've they've got all this stuff they got to figure out how to get good at. And that was another thing is, uh, you know, they wanted to learn from us how we clear houses. They wanted to learn from us, like, how do you set up your teams and stuff like that. Uh, security even, because they they don't have heavy machine gunners right. to set up security. So they, they did have the weapon systems. They just didn't know how to set up their kit. They didn't know like some of those things. So it was, again, it was very much just knowledge sharing uh, so that we were effective, an effective combined force. 
And I'm sure that your the hairstyling tips and <laughs> we uh, <laughs> there was a guy on on one of my subsequent deployments. We called him. Uh, he actually had this as a as an assigned name from them, but Dapper Dan because <laughs> he had long long hair and he always had it slicked back and always had to be like a pretty boy on everything even like if he took his helmet off on a mission like <laughs> i was like do you have product in your hair right now <laughs> it's like yeah man all the time <laughs> like, all right <laughs> so um so that was your third trip and that was to baghdad yep. and it, are there any like major like big stories or any very memorable me- events from that um not well I have funny stories. <laughs> Get us. We'll, we'll take it. So uh, in Baghdad, they have Baghdad University. Uh, and uh, they also have the American University in Baghdad. Um, and we were doing a daytime mission. One of the fewer times we were doing a daytime mission. And uh, my team leader, actually, no, I think it was squad leader at the time, was sitting out of one of the hatches. And a uh, really good-looking gal walks by. And basically is like, dang, these girls look good out here like that. And she whips around and was like, I speak English, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> like, clear as could be. And I was like, everybody was like, ooh, because like, everybody heard it. Like she yelled it <laughs> and everybody heard it. <laughs> I was like, which is, it. that was a weird thing too about uh, Baghdad was like, um, Baghdad was so much more uh, cosmopolitan. Yeah, cosmopolitan yeah. to where um, Missoula was much more, I'll say, more rural, like much more, you know, dirt huts and stuff like that, especially outside of the downtown area. It's just not as developed. Uh, Baghdad was like, you're in a, you're in a city. Honestly, yeah. it was like a developed city. An international city. Yeah. yeah. And so it was just, it was very weird in that regard. Like you're, you're actively at war against an insurgency, yet everybody else is going about their daily lives. Like the markets are running, the people are doing, you know, their day-to-day jobs, everything you would imagine a a city functioning would do. People going to college, all that kind of stuff. At the same time, you're trying to find a high value target that's somewhere weaved in with them. And you're like, I mean, that, that actually is something that like puts you on super high alert Mm -hmm. because you just don't know where it's going to come from. Uh, and unfortunately that actually happened to us. Um, and actually, I take back what I said. This happened to us in Missoula. Um, so one of our guys did pass away in Missoula, I think on my second deployment. Um, but it was it was like that where it was we were in a market, everything was moving, you know, it was busy time, and uh, you know, people would just pop out of somewhere and, and start yeah. shooting in the middle of everything going on. And the bizarre thing is, I think that the people are so used to it that often they didn't react. So it was even harder to pick out who the people were, the bad people. Because you, you see all these people moving around and you, you're thinking they're targets. And I'm so glad. Like, that's another thing with, with Rangers, at least my you know, platoon. We were very good trigger discipline. I feel very good about saying, like, we never killed civilians or did anything like that. Like, we had very good trigger discipline every time. But uh, we had multiple RPGs shot at us. We were like, where the fuck are they coming from? And... Uh, we even had one shot at us and it, it blew up an ammo can and they they thought somebody thought at first it was so hot like that the ammo can just blew up by itself and i was like that doesn't make any sense i was like an ammo can doesn't just blow up mm. you know because we put our ammo cans for the 50 cows on top of the right, strikers right. yeah and so the the tc was standing next to it and blew up next to him and how he didn't get hurt or anything i don't know it's crazy uh but within a, a few moments later the very next truck gets an rpg and actually hits one of our guys one of the tcs and ended up passing and uh and like it's just crazy to be in that environment where you just don't know mm-hmm. where it's going to come from especially in daytime like we hate i s- still to this day hate daytime ops like the people who did daytime ops i'm just like like we own the night on purpose right you know we, right we can work within night vision and, and have uh, you know superiority over the enemy by having night vision like that's such a huge asset that people don't realize until you're put in those types of situations yeah it's interesting that it's like one of those things that was true you know of our generation that like we really did own the night I wonder if that's true anymore when yeah. you see uh, you know Ukraine 
the the proliferation of night vision, thermals, all these sorts of things, ISR, yep. things that like we exclusively had. Uh, and nowadays, I mean, I think especially if we go into a real shooting war and Rangers, other mili or U.S. military elements are not necessarily going to have that advanced superiority that we had 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I like, um, you know, I told you guys earlier that I spent a little bit of time in Ukraine, but mostly on the training side. But I, I'm connected with a lot of people still there. Um, and they talk about that, about like how uh, they'll having night vision is still a huge asset, but Russia also has night vision right. now. It's like it's it's not the same sort of uh, advantage that we had in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like it's it's much like we definitely went on ops in Afghanistan, especially where we did run into people who uh, um, like we had multiple times where uh, people would get, you know, hemmed up in the mountains, for instance, and like their gear would be taken from mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And then the night vision ends up in the Taliban's hands and then they end up using it against us. Um, there was situations like that, but it was few and far between. Now you've got potentially, yeah, Russians aren't well equipped across the board, but they're equipped enough right. to where you have you, you these can't hot ha spots. You can't have your IR strobe up. Exactly. You know, you, yeah, a lot of that, even the communications and the direction finding and all that stuff. Is, exactly. It's it's so different. And I, I honestly could not, I, I could not imagine being like on the front line in Ukraine right now. Um, I know it would just be a completely different war. It would not... Any of the TTPs that I learned in Iraq and Afghanistan, maybe as like the individual uh, TTPs, yeah, probably work. Yeah, I needed, you know, how we shoot, move, communicate, that sort of thing. But what we use for imaging, for movement techniques, even for, for all of that, like kind of goes out the window. Right. Because you right. just don't know what the capabilities are of Russian troops. So... Baghdad, and then uh, and then the next one was Afghanistan. Yeah, so um, it's interesting how it happened. So I think they did this on purpose. Uh, personally, I think they tried to put uh, the same unit in the same place just because they knew the area. Right, and right. Our, our rotations were so short. So they were like, well, instead of having to relearn an area, we'd rather just put you in the same place. So my first two were in uh, Mosul, Iraq. And then my fourth and fifth deployment were in uh, Fab Shank. So Logar province, or no, Wardak province. Uh, we were also operating in Logar, but in Wardak, Wardak province uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and that's completely different, <laughs> like night and day different from Baghdad right, right. And, and Mosul because uh, everything was offset infills for the most part. We would do every once in a while landing on the X and the Y. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, like landing within the X is usually 500 meters uh 500 meters or less uh, landing on the Y could be like one kilometer, 500 meters roughly. Um, and so it's, it's close. You're still very close. Uh, but most of our ops were offsets to where we mostly would, a terrain future yeah. away. Exactly. Where they would drop us off, you know, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers away. And then we would walk mm -hmm. to the objective. And these are mostly helicopter assault force yep. missions. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we did, I don't think we did anything with trucks and shank. Uh, yeah, please. Um, we do you only... guys need rocks? Sure. Yeah. Um, we didn't do any, uh, anything vehicle wise in shank, but, uh, my sixth deployment, we ended up in Kandahar and we did, I think t not that many, like three or four ops with the trucks. Everything was still for the most part. Afghanistan, again, very rural place. Like, um, it's a, it's a unique place that you just, thank you so much. Um, it's a unique, unique place. Uh, honestly, the crazy thing is I, I even told uh, a lot of people who grew up, anybody who served in the Marine Corps again that went to 29 Palms, anybody in the Yucca Valley area, I told Bo, uh, who grew up in Yucca Valley, it's very similar to that terrain, like that area. Yeah. You've got these, these long flat lands uh, in, in some areas where it's, it's desert, open desert. And then you've got these massive mountains just kind of springing up out of nowhere. Um, and you could be at any night, either walking flat ground or walking over significant terrain. Um, and it was, it was interesting just that, uh, 
yeah, that switch, that complete switch in 180. And again, our op tempo in, in Shank was just not the same as even Baghdad. Like we told you in, in, uh, in Baghdad, we probably did 40, 50 missions, something like that. In Shank, we probably even did a little bit less, probably like 30, 40. And were they the same type of uh, sort of point target missions or were they, I mean, did you guys do like presence patrols or anything like that or were they mostly just sort of CT style DAs? Yep, yep. Uh, direct action raids for the most part for all of it. Um, uh, even in, um, uh, even in, in Iraq, we, for the most part, we had one offset mission that I can remember um, just outside of Missoula. Otherwise, it was all truck-based. We did a few VIs, uh, vehicle interdictions. Um, but then in Afghanistan, it was all, for the most part, offset direct action raids. Like, we might have, like, a cluster of uh, homes, you know, huts or whatever within a village that, mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to find our target and we're, like, bouncing between, so we have multiple follow-on targets. Sometimes even we would have two guys that did pop up that are in the same valley, we would hit one and then, well, you're already there, might as well go to the next one. Right. Um, so we had, we had situations like that. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it was, it was just, uh, direct, direct action raids. We had the one time I was telling you guys, uh, before where there was a downed helicopter that we had to go and go pull security for so that they could get it extracted. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it was just all direct action. And what was it like for you guys? Um, would, you guys had been doing these back-to-back -back Iraq missions, and then you go out. And even though you said Missoula is a little bit more rural, there's still kind of, I imagine that a lot of it is still very um, kind of city-based in a yeah. way. And then now you're out in Afghanistan, where one terrain feature away can be a hell of a movement. <laughs> like, it can yeah. be no joke, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I remember one mission in particular that we were supposed to land on the Y. Um, but something happened while we were airborne that they had to adjust. And we went from thinking we're literally sprinting to the target to they offset us 12 K away. <laughs> and they, uh, Which 12 K is like, uh, what? Like 10 miles. Five K is three miles. So yeah. Yeah. Nine ish miles. Yeah. yeah nine ish yeah. miles. Um, so they offset us and, uh, one of the attachments that we have with us. So, uh, for the most part, everything's staffed by Rangers, right? Like we have, uh, even uh, Ranger JTACs, Ranger dog handlers, Ranger everything. Uh, but in this case we had a, uh, I can't remember what he did exactly, but he was, he came from a, a regular army unit. Uh, so he, d he wasn't up to, I'll say the fitness level that we were. Right. And he just didn't plan accordingly. Like we always plan for contingencies and plan for whatever we need to do, you know. So we planned for the for the uh, 10k or 12k offset uh, earlier in the evening, but we scrapped it and said, okay, we're going to the Y. And then while we were in the air, they were like, nope, actually, we got to go to that offset. Right. So, um, but this kid, he uh, he didn't pack any water. He didn't tell anybody about what we were doing. When we landed, they said. Uh, we asked if they were going to shift our timeline because now we have to do this massive offset. And they were like, no, you have two hours to get there. So we're hauling ass through knee deep snow in some areas. I'm being dead serious. Like it was wild. Like we're, we're moving quick through, uh, luckily it wasn't severe mountains, but it was hilly terrain all mm -hmm. the way through, uh, drifts of snow, everything, you know, we got to get through it. And, uh, this kid didn't pack any water. I'm pretty confident he had snivel gear under his under his kit. So it's overheated real so, quick. Yeah. So he was a heat cat when we showed up there. Right. Collapsed heat cat. And uh and so they're dealing with him, we're doing the objective and everything like that, clearing it. Then uh BSO meets us out there and he had been sitting there for a little bit, turns into hypothermic. <laughs> so he goes from a heat cat to a cold casual, right. all in the same mission. And I'm like right. Oh my gosh, what is the chance? It's like I, I felt bad for him, don't get me wrong, and I was sucking even, like all of us were. Because again, we we were sweating profusely yeah, right. to get out there, and then you're standing and then there you're pulling standing security, there after freezing. You, yeah, because what people don't like maybe realize too, if you if you don't do this, is like you're going your your actual mission probably only lasts a couple of minutes. The rest of it is doing like sensitive site exploitation, 
uh, dealing with all uh, separation of you know military age males and women and children and stuff like that, doing uh, field interrogations, like all that, the post op uh, process, and that takes time. Right. And so for the people who are just not having to engage in any of that, you're just sitting there. Yeah. And going from sweating to now kneeling in the snow and not doing anything like that's starting to freeze over. So for again for us, we for the most part knew. And what we were doing is we were actually even like having guys rotate between security positions. So they're just moving. Uh, but this guy, again, I can't remember what his role was, but he was a cold casualty at this point. Anyways, he was worthless or a heat cat. He was worthless. Yeah. Um, so he was just sitting there and then he became a cold casualty. And I was just like, man. Yeah. And that's, it, it's tough, you know, because like you say, like you guys aren't wearing, you guys probably aren't wearing snowball gear because you got, you, you know, you have to move. But for somebody who thinks they're going to get dropped off relatively close to the target, Mm -hmm. And then sit around, they're probably wearing thermals, and then they've got to move this distance. So now they're sweating their balls yeah. off. And then, like you say, then he stops, and then it's just like, yeah. 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 It's wild. And, uh, yeah. I actually loved uh, I loved the offsets. Or not the offsets, the like landing on the X and the Y. Because I had a thing with all of our guys. It's like, if, if, I'm, if I'm the first one, or even if I'm not the first one, if I'm pulling security or I need to be the assault force, so if I'm either security or assault one, I'm going to be the first one to that building. And I always had a bet. And I was like, I bet you guys I'll be the first one in the building. I'll <laughs> sprint past everybody, literally, and get to the, be the first one every time. And that was my, like, goal. So I just wanted to <laughs> beat everybody to the building. But, uh, yeah, just internal things. Like, it was fun. So it, were you, uh, I, and not to get into TTPs, but were the the nature of your operations, even though you're still doing these direct action hits, were were they different? Was there a learning curve for you guys from Iraq to Afghanistan? I would say, yeah, absolutely. Um, because in Afghanistan, at this point now, we had started transitioning. Um, we even did this in Iraq. Uh, so towards the tr tail end of my my deployment in Iraq. We started having uh, IA with us, so Iraqi Army folks attached mm -hmm. to us, because we started training them on, you know, how to clear objectives and like how to go through the post op and everything. And even uh, when we would, you know, take somebody into custody, we had to hand them off to uh, the Iraqis to actually go through their whole judicial system. Mm -hmm. um, so they learned is like or well, not go through their judicial system, <laughs> depending, yeah. depending on who they the do. revolving door. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they they had to have the Iraqis with us so that the process was just a lot quicker. Right. In Afghanistan, um, it it was we were already transitioning to where we were trying to teach the Afghans how to run ops, so that we we were more or less just an attachment to them. You're working with the KKA. Uh, who were we working with? Um, the uh maybe it was the KKA. Um. Afghan commandos. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what their unit designation exactly was, but uh, they were they were attached to us every time. Uh, our first trip to Shank was less so. Our second trip, it was a split force, literally 50-50, um, where we had one assault squad, one security squad, and then they had two assault squads. Um, and then my sixth deployment, so when we were in Kandahar, uh, it was the same. And honest, honestly, most of the time we were a platoon heavy then at that point is like we would say one assault squad but it was like a heavy assault squad mm -hmm. and then a security squad um and then we had the afghans with us but uh that changed things a lot um when my first two deployments in afghanistan we still took the lead on clearing buildings and everything uh by my last deployment the afghans were supposed to be the first people in the building so we were supposed to be just basically supporting them now when you say supposed to be how'd that work out <laughs> depends on where we were yeah depends if we were in a firefight or not um i uh my last deployment i remember we got in a, a really bad firefight in a compound and we had a follow-on target and uh afghans were terrified they didn't want to go in and clear the building they didn't want to go in and clear the initial building where we had the firefight and they didn't want to go into the follow-on and i i got it like the guy who was the the main uh uh, uh, commander of their unit he spoke really good English and I remember talking to him and like having this whole conversation I was like look man you guys are supposed to be the ones that clear this building first I was like we have to get it cleared 
do you want us to go? 